Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last minute of play in the third period. Uh, I'm going to start the show off uh, today with uh, something we didn't get to uh, last episode on Monday. Uh, it's an article from the CBC.ca saying uh, the QMJHL uh, commissioner says paying junior hockey players would be a mistake. Now, there's a couple uh, things in this article uh, where they get uh, thoughts on from uh, Gilles Courteau, who is the QMJHL commissioner. One is on trading uh, uh, like uh, QMJHL players and trading teenagers and these big trades that have been happening, how that's kind of disruptive to their development. But another one is on their pay, their the paying them to play, and it says this. Another hot topic facing junior hockey in recent years is the issue of pay. Some have argued that because junior hockey teams are selling tickets and filling the grandstands, players deserve to be compensated with at least minimum wage. Corto disagrees with this line of thinking, saying a, pair, a player should never be considered as an employee. Corto, Corto argues that beyond the financial impact of the teams, paying players would undermine the league's mission to develop amateur athletes. Another quote from him saying, We don't want to give the players uh, additional responsibility of an employee. We want him and... We, we want him to play in the QMJHL and concentrate on hockey in school, nothing else. Gentlemen, thoughts? Um, I have a lot of them, so I'm going to do something first. Ah! Yeah, this is going to take longer than like a minute to talk about, so I figured we'd just play that and then we'll go from there. Um, that was a great transition, though. Very well done. <laughs> Very well done, sir. Thank you. Just let me do uh, the thing. I, my biggest problem with this is that this isn't the first time we've heard this exact line of thinking. Yep. It's, like, it kind of sounds like he's regurgitating stuff like the NCAA has said he, in the past. He, he, he <laughs> is, I think, verbatim regurgitating what the NCAA says, typically. Which is just like, uh, yeah, next question. I don't want to talk about this because I don't want to pay them. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's so annoying because they should at least make minimum wage in that they are old enough to work and are working in that they are generating capital for a team. But the fact of the matter is, if you made them pay a lot of if you made them pay players, a bunch of these junior franchises shut down instantly. Like they don't have the capital or the ability to be running otherwise. Which isn't to say that they should be allowed to run if they don't have that capital, because they shouldn't. But the ramifications of that to a lot of people, I think it's actually pretty high. I think you you probably lose teams like Bathurst. Uh, you almost for sure lose teams in like smaller Quebec communities. And let's not ignore the fact that if you go out west, there are some pretty obscure places with franchises that's fair mm. um but like minimum wage they wouldn't be able to even though i guess i guess it all depends on like yeah i guess where which ones draw the most crowds and everything like that like what what's your metric for minimum wage are they being paid exclusively for the time that they are practicing at team facilities and traveling with the team for games or are they getting paid as if it's a traditional work week um i would say like at least like compensate them for I'm sure there's like 20 or 25 hours, like however much you would make like doing like part-time job hours or something like that during the week, considering that they aren't doing it like eight hours a day, every single day, that sort of thing. I don't know. That would be like a lot of semantics you'd have to work out in that point. Well, if I'm not mistaken, they, they get allowances. It, it's, it's not like a full-on pay, but they do get an allowance. So th like to cover like what? Like laundry detergent? Yeah, like, like meals? The, the essentials. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, and but it, it's junior hockey is way more complicated than that. It, it is. These guys are minors, so they can't live on their own. A lot of them live with billet families, and they otherwise have sponsors and other people who are taking care of them. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as professional sports, where the it the craziest thing is it's such a facsimile to the NCAA. It's wild because mm -hmm. they essentially have someone else cover their housing, have someone else cover. Any additional educational costs, if they're going to hockey academies, that stuff's usually covered. The difference is that instead of it being paid for by a college and them being adults who should be paid and aren't, it's being paid for by usually sponsors or private citizens, and they are minors who aren't being paid when they should also be paid. Yeah. No. It's 
it's a uh, it's a tricky road to navigate that's for sure because that's one of the things that people don't take into consideration and we talked about this in regards to was it mckenna a couple weeks ago oh about mm. like just him being like bounced around from team to team to team yeah part of the reason why athletes are paid as well as they do is because they generate a bunch of capital but they also have very little freedom over their own lives yep. unless you negotiate protections for yourself if you're if your owners, lit- literally the people who essentially own you, mm-hmm. have the ability to move you, if they can find a deal, you have no say in whether or not you move. Your choices are agree to the trade as it is or retire. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it's also like, uh, it's, it's a lot of things like when we talk about like contracts and everything, like there is like dollars and cents you got to talk about and everything like that. But also like, again, like they, there is so much control, like you don't get to do a lot of things. Like you can't go like, there's a lot of activities you can't do anything that puts you in any like potential danger to be like injured or anything like that. Like that's never discussed at all in the media or anything like that. So yeah, there's like you have, you, yes, like athletes for the most part especially when they get to the pro level are paid handsomely but like there's sacrifices to it all around so they earn it all right well, let's get sean in here and then we'll move on yeah no i mean really i i don't really have much to say about this other than the fact that pe- people sit and j- just say you know athletes are overpaid but w- when you look at the grand scheme of things they're destroying their bodies like yeah. if if you've seen like the I, I guess the interior of a hockey player's body after an 82 game season in the NHL, it's it's ridiculous how torn up it is, and and it's, I'd be willing to bet even though junior players are younger and they can have quicker turnarounds, I still do think that you do need to compensate them for that because because they're throwing their bodies out there. Yeah, the Houston Texans announced yesterday that JJ Watt had to have a minor operation done to have additional or extra grown cartilage removed from his knee. Jesus. Which was apparently totally common and fine and the procedure was okay to the point that it was they, they didn't even consider it newsworthy. Yep. No. We should move on. All right, Sean, do you have the roundup? There were no games this week. Oh, yeah, right, because we recorded yeah, on that, Monday. Yeah, that's Monday. Except one, and it was ugly. Oh, yeah, it's true. Yeah. UMB mm. beat Moncton 10 nothing. Oh, yeah, that's right. UMB beat Moncton 10 I forgot about that, Sean. You should have double-checked because UMB might have had some sort of bet. UMB had volleyball games this week. I know that for sure. St. Thomas did, too. Really? Yeah, I, I didn't think Sean. UMB did. Sean. Tiss, tiss, tiss. tiss. Yeah. Uh, Anyways. It's an off week. Because, you know, we've been covering a lot of AUS and ACA volleyball. Mm-hmm. I, oh, I actually want to address something right now because I it has come up and people have asked and I feel like we should clarify. The reason why we focus so much on hockey is because it is the one sport. First off, we all work in the sphere. You know, Sean does color commentary. I do play-by-play for UMB Women's Hockey. Johnny writes for UMB Women's and Men. Sean writes for St. Thomas Women's Hockey as well. So we all have a levels of work in the, the field. Mm-hmm. It's also because it's the one sport where the two institutions that we at, that attend, that we sort of service our, our local market, play each other. Yeah. With the exception of, like, two minor ones, like track and field, which we have yeah. covered a little bit because of Jen Bell's records. And also, apparently, St. Thomas is officially nationally ranked in U Sports Cross Country. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don't they? Don't, do does you and me have a rugby team? Do they play? Yes, rugby? they also. Uh, play rugby. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. They play. At, they both play at the ACAA level, which we did cover earlier on this year. Because I'm pretty sure was it the rugby team that first coined the phrase "battle on the hill," or was it or was it hockey? No, that was a men's hockey thing. Men's hockey thing. Okay, but I think that's been around for a while because I remember St. Thomas moved to Fredericton from Chatham back in like the '60s. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And those early 60s St. Thomas hockey teams were really good. Mm-hmm. Story anyway. for another time. Anyways, uh, so UMB beats Moncton 10 uh, nothing. Shame on you. At the Mark Jeffrey Memorial game or whatever. Yeah, that's like the one oh, yeah. That's the one number they have retired, right? Yes. When, when did he play? I, don't, I have no I actually have no background on this at all. Yeah. That's sorry. one of the interesting things about, like, university is... Kind of once people are gone, they're gone. Yeah. 
but there's like this one this one um uh, yeah there's just one number i always mean to ask like andy or something like that about who uh, is he yeah yeah because like it's the one number that's retired like why is why is why is why is that the case um but anyways uh moncton shame on you for giving uh the reds no t loss and they made them pay for it <laughs> a shootout loss a shootout loss yeah so uh yeah it was pretty much domination from start to finish so there's not yep. much you can digest with a 10 nothing game Andy wrote the best recap I think I've ever read. I actually, the, did, I actually the, didn't the read it. The first line is, man, was it a bad night to be a, a Moncton oh, goaltender. Oh, 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 Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yes, boss, it was. Thank yes, you. Yes, they did was. yank the goalie, right? Oh, oh yeah. For I, sure. I, I, don't I, I would imagine. Z- I don't, I'm not checking that. No, like Mario Tremblay, yes. Patrick Waugh level stuff going on. No. No, but yeah. Um, Jeez. Yeah, it was just uh, an annihilation from start to finish. I think... I don't think there's any multiple goal, goal scorers on here either. It was 10 different Reds players. <laughs> that <laughs> nice. is actually yeah. awesome. Yeah, two power play goals. That, that's what happens goal. when you're up 7 nothing and you just bench your top six. Yeah, uh, yeah, two power play goals, shorthanded goal, four in the first, four in the second, two in the third. Dove McFalls third. back yet? Uh, Dove McFalls. I will check this. While you're checking that, we'll mention St. Thomas alumnus Kelty Apperson. Currently oh, yes. plays for the Calgary Inferno. If you would like, they just did a essentially the jer- a jersey off your back night for charity for the Calgary Inferno. Her jersey is currently available on eBay. You can just Google Calgary Inferno and all the jerseys come up. Uh, when I checked it this morning, the winning bid for Kelty's jersey was two hundred and twenty five dollars. You, yeah, can, you can tell the people who've played for Team Canada and Team USA though, because I forget which player it is, but someone's pulling like three grand right now. Really? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. Uh, pretty good. You think we could see her in 2022? No. No? No, no, no. She. You have mm. to understand, you have, like, it sounds bad to say, but as good as she was, and she was an AUS MVP and would have won a national MVP if Guelph's goalie that year wasn't on, like, all the juice. And that's not me saying she was, like, actually juiced up. I just mean she was really, really good. <laughs> should, should specify. We talk about steroids a lot on this show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, it's a distinction. Kelty only has like four points this year. She's a bit player oh, on that team. Oh, which man. is is what well, it is. It's also, a nice thought though. Also, Worcester, the, the the Boston team in the CWHL has no wins through twenty games. Oh really? Yeah. Any like overtime? No, losses? they have zero points in the standings. They're 0 and twenty. It's good. Boston no deserves way. a loser. Yeah. Go what? Google it. Oh my god. <laughs> Look up the CWHL no, right now. No, I believe you. I believe you. Um, no, Dove I Mc- need to see no Dove McFalls. Okay, so yet. he's still he's yeah. still yeah. brained. He's still he's still out. Um, so uh, should we move on from yeah. AUS? Uh, Fredericton's getting a new skate park, which is good because we've needed one. Yeah, um, I I actually talked to um, oh uh, the name escapes me of the guy that was just uh, basically like championing it and everything like that. But there have been like multiple town halls over the past couple of years, like advocating for this hard. Uh, I know that uh, Penelope Stevens, who uh, plays in the band Motherhood, a good friend of the station, helped us with organize our festival that went along with our national radio conference that we put on last year, um, is looking to use that also as like a music venue as well. There's a lot of big opportunities coming through um, with um, with not only the skate park, but like just an overall like like community kind of gathering place and everything like that. So it's good for them. They've they worked hard and they. They definitely put in the hours and the miles to uh, make this happen. Uh, we will move on to the Australian Open, which is going on right now. Uh, as we've talked about, this is sort of the golden era of Canadian tennis, or I guess a new a new one, the one. I'm not going to lie. Before we did this show, I really didn't care about tennis. Now that we do this show, I find tennis yeah. extremely fascinating. See, I didn't appreciate tennis until... In my first year, every Saturday night, I'd go and play tennis at the Abney Family Tennis Center, out by the Grand Harvey Center. Yeah. Oh, and tennis is actually so physically demanding and awesome to play. I, I highly recommend for anyone who gets a chance. Oh. When, when I used to go to uh, Boys and Girls Club when I lived back in Truro, uh, I got really good with, like, there was a couple of uh, players, uh, people that went there that were, like, junior national champions at ping pong. And even oh. that, like, it's similar kind of game style but like just not as like as much force required or it's less like deliberate that. yeah less deliberate but even that is like demanding on like just being agile and everything like that yeah yeah 
no, it's it's definitely a sport that needs a little bit more respect than it gets. Talking about the Canadians in the field, uh, Jeannie Bouchard got eliminated in the second round, yeah. which is another disappointing finish for her in a year of disappointing finishes. Hasn't it been a couple couple years at this point? I mean, she was saying at the beginning of this year that this was going to be sort of the comeback. Yeah. And hasn't started well. Has she made, like, like round of 16 or anything like that this year? I'm sure she has an event. I don't exactly know. I know she's still not ranked. Oh, she's still in... She was ranked before, though. Was yeah. she in, like, the top 100 or top yeah. 50, something like yeah. that? I think I think you have to make the top 32 to be seated, and I know she's been seated at events before, mm-hmm. but I don't think in the last couple of years she has. Yeah. And Andrescu is eliminated by... It was Serena Williams, right? She played... Did she play Williams? Mm, was that her or was that Bouchard? I thought Bouchard got eliminated by Williams. I thought Andrescu did. I'm not sure. I will double-check really quick. Yeah. But, yeah, Brianna Andrescu... While you're checking that, gets eliminated. I have a really funny stat for you guys. Uh, Bouchard got eliminated by Williams. Okay. okay. So go, going back to something that Kaylee said about Worcester in the CWHL. Worcester. They have Worcester. Ooh. It's Worcester. I said Worcester, didn't I? You sure did. Yeah. Anyway. Their goal differential is negative 96. They have 12 goals for. Yeah, that team's awful. 12, uh, 12 wait, goals for, 108 against. In, t- in 20 games? In 20 games. So they've been shut out like eight times, something like probably that. Probably more. Probably more. So basically, yeah. their average loss is like five one. Yeah. Whoa. Night in, night out. Whoa. No, and, and none of the losses are overtime shootout. No, just nope. all regulation. Oh, that's. Brutal. I just wanted to point that out. Mm-hmm. It's because this is where you sort of get into this weird kind of talent gap. If you are a high-profile Canadian women's player, why would you go play for that team? Yeah. That's if true. you're a high-profile female, um, like a high-profile American player, why would you go play for that team? Because the NWHL exists. Yeah. yeah and true. pays better than the CWHL. That mm-hmm. does. Yeah, that's rough. And I can't wait for those leaks to be merged. Sean's favorite women's hockey player is currently a CWHL leading scorer. Uh, who's that? Mary Philippe Poulet. Oh, yeah. well. That should be every Canadian's favorite women's hockey player. It's true. Like, it's it's she's the take. best. <laughs> but mine is Natalie Spooner exclusively because I watched her on The Amazing Race. Yeah. Wasn't she uh, on Sportsnet or something like that last night, I think? She was on Tim and Sid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was on Tim and Sid, yeah. Sid last night. That's cool. Because she's in Toronto for the All-Star game, I think. Uh, ah, yeah. right. Because right, right, that's right. happening. Andreas, who got knocked out by 13th ranked, uh, first name escapes me, Anastasia Sevastova from Latvia. Uh, she forced a third set. Uh, and then lost. Uh, for her, that's fine. Because she, for Andrescu, I think that's a fine finish. Yeah. After yeah. her breakup performance, she wasn't even ranked high enough to automatically qualify for the Aussie Open. She had to take part in qualifiers. You know, made it through a qualifying bracket. Won her first round game against uh, another qualifying player. Mm-hmm. Took the 13th seeded person to a third set. I think that's fine. Yeah. Um, and that's her first major, right? Uh, I don't know if it's her first major overall, but I assuming it's her first positioning for a major. No, she's appeared in Wimbledon in 2017, but got knocked out in the first round. This is the first time she's ever advanced a round at a grand at a Grand Slam. Okay, so there's there's prog there's still progress being made here and everything yeah, like that. Exactly. Should we like? She's just, only 18, right? And should we dial back on just like our expectations and everything? Like every time a Canadian happens to do something noteworthy in tennis. Because it seems like I think it's because we I think I think deep down even if we pretend we don't care we like that sport and we want to be good at it yeah because and this is the thing they make a big deal of the Rogers Cup every year the mm-hmm. Davis Cup which is essentially yeah, the World Cup of tennis they make a big That's deal fair. out of because they actually take that countrywide like they play some of their home games in Vancouver some of them in Toronto mm-hmm. um, I think I was hearing rumors that Halifax might get to host Davis Cup games that'd Ooh. be cool I think they did last year too. That'd was they really host cool. a couple Davis Cup games in Halifax. Mm. So, you know, at least the World Cup of tennis is a nationwide thing. If you are a tennis fan, that is a coast-to-coast thing. So, yeah, we care. So we don't want yeah. our team to stink. And for your team to be good, you need to have better players. Which is why it bums me out that Gabriella Dabrowski, who is, I think, ranked ninth in the world in doubles, never gets any attention. Even though she's the third, she's on the third seeded team in women's doubles with yeah, a Chinese and what, partner. And what's her name, sir? Gabriella Dabrowski. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, same thing. And like, she's like, I think, I think she's part of the top ranked team in mixed doubles with some dude from like Serbia or whatever. 
Yeah. And they're like, def- they're defending Australian Open champions. Never hear anything about her. Well, it's the same, like, like, it's it's kind of like the same thing, like with like uh, Daniel Nestor. Yeah. As well, like, who's easily the most accomplished Canadian tennis player of all time. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm pretty sure he ha- he has like a career Grand Slam. He's won every single Grand Slam yeah. event, and he has an Olympic gold medal. Yeah, and like and but like it's just like the fact he was a big doubles guy, right? Yeah, yeah. So like and he was the number one ranked doubles player in the world at one point. Yeah, and Who, he, who's his partner? And no one ever paid attention to him. His partner was an American for most of his career. I think the gold medal. I don't remember who his partner was for the gold medal. It was Nestor and someone. I know at the tail end of Nestor's career, his doubles partner was uh, Vashik Pospisil. Oh, okay. Cool. I don't know if he was for the Olympics, but... Mm. Anyway, so that was what I'm on the women's side of the bracket. On the men's side of the bracket, both um, Nilos Raonic and Denis Shapovalov have advanced to the third round. They actually both play tonight. Um, Kickoff time for both of their matches is 11.30 local time. Uh, Raonic is playing uh, Pierre Hughes Ebert, who is actually was like just a non seeded entrant and upset the 24th ranked player from South Korea, that being Hyun Chung. So Raonic actually gets a slightly easier road to the fourth round. That's not the game that's interesting, although I do want to actually take a second to talk about Raonic's second round game because it's actually really notable. But the matchup that everyone's going to be watching tonight, and I guarantee you it'll be like the headlining game on TSN and ESPN and wherever you're watching, 25th seeded Denis Shapovalov will face off against the top-ranked player in the world, Novak Djokovic. It's going to be a, it's going to be a tasty one, that's for sure. That's actually that would yeah. be a really good game. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And I like all the all props to Shapo for first off having them both ranked inside the top 32 is really really good. Yeah, and that's huge. Sure. It's good for Canadian tennis too. And Shapo losing to no, to Djokovic doesn't mean anything. Like if he loses here, everyone's gonna be like, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, for sure. But if he wins, like that's huge. That's yeah, huge. it's huge for his ranking. I think Roundage has more to lose where he's playing the unranked Bear. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. He's expected to win at that point. But the reason why I want to talk about Roundage is his second round game was against Stanislav Wawrinka, which okay. is the name that we should recognize. Because we talked about Andy Murray being the fourth guy. If you were to go back to that era of tennis, Wawrinka was the fifth guy. Oh, really? If you, go and, if you go and look at his career record, he was never higher seeded than third in the world. He was third in the world for a long period of time while the people around him shuffled. But he never made it past third in the world because he was always behind... Murray and Djokovic, or Djokovic and Nadal, or Nadal and Federer, or Federer and Djokovic. He was always number three. Even even a name I recognize even more than Wawrinka's is uh, would be like Andy Roddick or something like that. Yeah, and the thing is, Roddick's never like Wawrinka was actually more consistently good than Roddick was. Yeah, Roddick just had so many public yeah. outbursts that he yeah. he got more time in the spotlight. Wawrinka is has a career win percentage of sixty three percent. Uh, and he's Damn. he the only one that he is missing a Wimbledon title is the only one he's missing from a career Grand Slam. He has really? a win at the Aussie and the French and the U.S. Open. That's crazy. And the thing he also has an Olympic gold medal in doubles from Beijing. Stan Wawrinka is legit. Yeah, so he'll be in like whatever the tennis Hall of Fame is. It, or it, equivalent is yes. Yeah. The thing that people don't remember about Wawrinka and the reason why he doesn't come up very often is he had like a catastrophic knee injury. Really? Like was supposed to be a career ender, well, and yeah, then he you, came back a year ago. You want to think about um, a sport that more than like basketball that requires your knees? It's tennis. It's all knees because you're just. You're basically just like hopping back and forth constantly on those like like it's more lateral movement than any other sport in the world. And the thing was his ranking was high enough in compare like mixed with the 2008 gold medal. He was Switzerland's flag bearer at the 2012 Summer Olympics. Really? Like Warinka was like a big big deal. Jeez. And then his knee injury was like a catastrophic knee injury. He needed like a whole bunch of physio and like reconstructive stuff and a whole bunch of other things. Yeah. And he literally fell all the way out of the top 250. And now he's back up high enough that he was a, had a protected ranking and got into the Aussie Open without having to play in qualifying, okay. which is good for Warinka. But because his ranking isn't that high, it's currently 59, he played Roundage in the second round. Oh, uh, dear. Yeah. And Roundage beat him. He did, but I want to read the scoreline for you. For the record, uh, for anyone who doesn't understand tennis scores, if a set goes to, gets to 6-6... Yep. 
in games. You play a tie-breaking game, which is a single game that is played to, it's a best of seven, but you have to win by at least two points. Mm -hmm. Here is the stat line for the Warinka Raunich game. Game one is, uh, so the winner score is always first, so game one is 6-7. Tiebreaker won 7-4 by Warinka. The second set was 7-6. Tiebreaker won by Raunich 8-6. The third set was 7-6. Tiebreaker was 13-11. Fourth set was 7-6. Tiebreaker was 7-5. Really? Holy crap. They so went to tie-breaking points four sets in a row and passed the minimum number of points required in a tie-breaking set twice. Wow. Through four sets. Raunich won three sets to one. Damn. <sighs> That's... So Warenka's still got it. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's we, close we, to we've seen it too because I think he actually finished in like the top eight or whatever of another pretty big tournament recently, where he came in literally on what's called a protected ranking, which is that the tournament was just like you're coming back from an injury. Here's a pity slot. Yeah, and he just crushed a bunch of people. Damn. Like at the, at the time we're talking about Andy Murray retiring because his back is jacked. Yeah. The fact that we'll rank his back at all is incredible. Absolutely. And now he's ranked inside the top 60. I imagine a couple good performances will put him back on the top 32 like rankings. And then he who could knows, be, he man? Could be, he could be back in like the top 20 or 10 in like the next year or so, unless he does, unless that re does, that knee doesn't get re aggravated. So. Yeah. Yeah. Which is always a factor. But yeah, I wanted to bring that up because it was yeah. really notable. And when you see a score line like that, that's ridiculous. Like that's a ridiculous game. Mm -hmm. For sure. Because if every single game in tennis was the minimum points required, it's four points. So it's a minimum of four points across 48 games because they had to play, because they had to play, you know, 12 games in each set. So even if every single set was the bare minimum points it could be, that's four points times, or times 48 games. That's if it's the minimum, and you know it wasn't. But if it's the minimum, and then it's plus 11 points from the first tiebreaker, 14 points from the second, 24 points from the third, and 12 points from the last. If the game went the minimum length, they had 253 rallies. And how many did they actually have? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Because they don't re cause like I'm sure you can go in if you went to like some sort of like deep diving advanced stats tennis website and find out exactly how many points they played, but I don't track that information. Yeah. But the maximum hmm. number of points you can play in a round, not counting deuces and advantage, is like six. Damn. Yeah. So they could have played like oh. six hundred points. That's crazy. That's not. And the fact that like his knee like stood up for that whole that whole like, because that's war. a litmus test that is that is not a game that is played by having a good burst of like skill or speed that's an endurance contest mm -hmm. and one that he could have won because feasibly if you win the fourth round tiebreaker you go to a fifth you go to a fifth set that game's not over like yep. not even close yep crazy yeah <sighs> that's nuts it makes me wonder how Raonic is feeling because I think he played that game like I think he had one day of rest in between that game had to last like six hours. Something like that. Yeah. He'll, he'll be battle tested at least going into the next one. So. Anyway, so that's what's happening at the Aussie Open. Tune in tonight and watch the Djokovic Japo match. I'm assuming it'll be on TSN. Mm -hmm. Prob probably. Yeah. Uh, National Lacrosse League. Johnny has a story from the soon to be placed in Halifax National Lacrosse League that's got some horribly racist overtones. Yeah, so uh, it's a uh, Saskatchewan. This is about a Saskatchewan Rush player uh, that uh, had U.S. Uh, fans uh, shout about scalping his brother. Um, there was actually, I'm just going to read through this a little bit. Uh, on Saturday, Thompson's brother Lyle was playing uh, in for the National Lacrosse League's uh, Georgia Swarm when the Philadelphia Wings announcer told the crowd, "This is like the in-ring announcer. Uh, let's snip the ponytail." In response to like he had like a long braid that like was like visible out of his helmet and everything like that and uh some because fans, as like 30 percent of the population that like plays this game at a professional level he's probably like iroquois or some other something like that yeah native designation yeah anyway some fans reacted and philadelphia fans behind the bench began to shout calls to like scalp him and everything like Holy that crap that's yeah. so so these brothers both play in the nl one place for saskatchewan one place for georgia yes okay yeah if I'm if I'm putting this together properly, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Oh, here it is. Jeremy is uh, a member of the uh, Ona 
Onondaga Nation in New York uh, and a player for the Saskatchewan uh, Rush in Saskatoon. Yeah. yeah. So. That's brutal. Yeah, that's, that's pretty brutal. Insane, Is like... anyone surprised? Philadelphia fans, right? Yeah. If you get them Dude, going. No, they no, threw no, ice balls at it. Santa Claus. They threw what? They threw ice balls at Santa Claus. When? This was like an 80s Eagles game. When the Eagles were terrible. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen that. Yeah. No, it's pretty dis- – there's not much more it, to say. It's disgusting. It. Yeah, it's disgusting. No, and especially, like, no where lacrosse is a game that has, like, so much, like, Native American heritage in it, mm-hmm. that's extra gross. Yeah. Like, if it were not for the forefathers of the person you're taunting, you don't get to sit in the crowd and watch this game. So how about you, like, just shut your pie hole? Yeah. Literally, like, um, the lacrosse team for uh, CEC, the high school I went to for one year in Truro. That was my last year living in Truro. Um, it was started, like, it was the whole, um, like, in, there was, like, an indigenous, like, support, like, group. Like, all the, indi- the uh, indigenous students at that, at my school, like, that was, that was the whole team. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it's, yeah, you got to take that into account before you just be... A dick. <laughs> it's not even a dick. That's you're being straight up racist. Yeah. For no reason. Yeah. To like a twenty something kid who's trying to make money playing a sport where you don't make that much money. Yeah. Just because it to has put your body yeah, through the yeah. same kind of an ab- abuse a hockey player goes yeah, through. Yeah. Just because it has a similar acronym to the NHL or the NBA doesn't mean they make as much. So like. And uh, that Philadelphia well, team's an expansion franchise. Now, these aren't new fans. Philadelphia's had a team before, but they just got their team back. What are you doing? Yeah. No, it's inexcusable. Yeah. I, 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 w- I would add to it, but there's, I don't think there's anything you can add. Yeah. We I don't think they're, I don't think they're, expansion, they're like a new franchise, though, because Vancouver was the expansion franchise this year. Right. But, yeah. But yeah, no, like, there's legitimately nothing to say about it. Yeah, no, it's, it's disgusting. It's, it's just disgusting. Yeah. For, if, if anyone's wondering why the CBC rep- it's with CBC, right? CBC, yep. If you're wondering why the report's not actually talking to the Georgia Swarm player and specifically to the Saskatchewan Marsh player, one, he's in Canada, so it's probably easier to have access to him. Two, the rush of the defending champions. So it's a name that people are more likely to have heard. Yeah. And that's that's a smart move because like this is like probably a story that gets swept under on most media outlets and everything. Like when's the last time you've seen an NLL highlight pack? On a major sports network. Uh, to be fair, I've actually been following the season because the the Halifax team got announced. I joined the lacrosse subreddit. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wh- when are they? When are they slated to start? Next playing? year. Next year. That'll be cool. 18, I, wa- I want to go see a game. Or nineteen twenty. Yeah. Be good. Uh, if we don't hurry up, we're not going to get to hockey. And I know you guys have some stuff you want to talk about. So, uh, Austin FC MLS announces that their next expansion franchise is going to be in Austin. Yeah. I think that's fine. I think it's good. That's going to be the third team in Texas. Houston, Dallas, and Austin. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's good. fine. No, I, I mean, if so. if you're if you're selling tickets and you are partially because, you know, the MLS MLS is actually a good product now, and two, and this is no disrespect to people who live in Texas, but Mexicans. Yeah, mm-hmm. you have a lot yeah, of Mexican and immigrants close and- living in Texas. It's an easy sell. It's why soccer is an easy sell in California. Like that's fair. Th- this is not a judgment. It's why soccer is an easy sell in Toronto. Yeah, because like, like more than half the population are not natives of Toronto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Immigration sells soccer, and you want to know what? Good for it. Yeah, you absolutely. know what though? I think the game could be a lot bigger. I just don't think they market it the right way outside of the big cities. I think MLS markets really, really well in Canada, and oh, way definitely. worse in the U.S. Except yeah. in Texas um, and L.A. I think in L.A. they market really, really well. Oh, they have a great culture. To the point that L.A. lost a franchise and got one back a year later because investors were just like, what are you doing? This market's way too valuable. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. And Beckham's eventually going to get that team in Miami. Oh, yeah, that's true. Weren't him and LeBron working on that? Yeah, apparently LeBron was supposed to be one of the other investors. Yeah. I mean, make your money, man. You'll make a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, especially Miami. Everyone's just like, oh, but the Tampa Bay team folded so fast. Yeah, when the MLS was in its infancy, it had no idea how to advertise itself and still had a shootout to break tie games. I'm not kidding, by the way. That was a thing. Yeah. Oh, Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. It's stupid. Anyway, no shootouts. Peter Cech is retiring. Um, unfortunately, he is Cech, so he was never going to win a World Cup, but he's probably the greatest goaltender to ever live. Yep. I don't so think anyone's going to honor He can take that, that into his 
trophy case and enjoy it. I feel like we should read off his list of accomplishments because I think it's he's very the guy nice. who wears the helmet, right? Yes, Peter Check yeah. is the one who infamously wears the helmet. Yeah, I love Peter Check. He's thirty six. He's retiring uh, this year, and do go through like his career highlights really, really quick. Uh, career statistics: His career total is five hundred and sixty seven league appearances. 48 cup appearances, 22 league cup appearances, 125 European championship appearances, and 10 other appearances for 772 total appearances in net. Not counting 124 for the Czech national team. He won Premier Leagues with Chelsea in 05-06. Sorry, in 2005, 2006, 2010, 2015. Won the FA Cup in 07, 09, 10, and 12. The Football League Cup in 05, 07, and 15. Community Shield in 05 and 09. Champions League in 2012. Europa League in 2013. Won another FA Cup with Arsenal in 2017. Um, won the Europe Under-21 Championship in 2002 as a player for the Czech Republic. Uh, was the MVP at that same tournament. He has the most shutouts in Czech First League history. He was the goaltender of the year in the French League in 2004. Uh, UEFA or uh, UEFA European Championship team of the tournament in 2004, Golden Glove for best goalie in the Premier League in 05, 10, 14, and 16. He made the team of the year, which is essentially like the first ballot All Star in 05 and 2014. He was Czech Footballer of the Year in 05, 08, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, and 16. Oh my god! He won the Golden Ball for being the best uh, or. Uh, for the Czech Republic in 05, 06, 07, 08, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 17. Uh, best European goaltender in 05, 07, 08. Um, club awards, best goaltender in UEFA club competition in 05, 07, 08. Was on UEFA's team of the year in 2005. Uh, Chelsea's individual player of the year in 2011. So he's the best Czech soccer player of all time. Yes. Yeah. He's also arguably the best goaltender to ever play soccer. Yeah. There you go. There yeah. you go. There you go. Uh, Sejudo is going to fight Dillashaw for the flyweight title. Yep. Basically uh, putting that uh, division to rest for... Yeah. I, I, now that it's so folded. this is not a judgment. If they hate the flyweight division so much, why is Sejudo not moving up? Is my question. Well, I think like they're just they're just keeping that title in there to sell the super fight, and then I'm guessing Sejudo will move up because well that weight that weight class doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. So, so is the hope that Dillashaw wins and merges the title so they can just be done with it, or are they kind of hoping Sejudo wins so when the division shuts down they can be like, well, he beat Dillashaw. Well, regardless, like whoever wins will be a double champ. So both belts are on the line. I'm pre- I'm pretty sure they are. You aren't can't. They? Oh, you can't? No. Oh. You can't do that. Oh, I thought weight you classes. Could. Hmm. No, because they wouldn't be in the weight class to defend that belt. Unless the UFC wants to arbitrarily change the rules WWE style. Yeah. Which I wouldn't put past Dana White and the brain trust. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think the winner of this fight just is the champion of that division, I guess. Yeah. Since it's not... Yeah. That division's dead, so mm-hmm. who cares? But, like, the, the, the division up, which would be Bantam weight. Yeah, but it's not a bantamweight fight. It's a flyweight fight, right? Yeah, they'll bend the rules for that, I think. I think they're I think they're hoping that TJ will put Sejudo out to pasture. Mm-hmm. No, like, not retire him, but beat him so cleanly that they can be like, see, there's no competition in the flyweight division. And then, you know, we'll come into the booth and we'll go, Mighty Mouse! Mighty Mouse, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who, I'm not sure when his first fight with one champion is championship supposed to be, but... Uh, I'm shocked that Bellator didn't just make a flyweight division for him. Yeah. You would have made so much money. <laughs> Yep. So much cash. Anyway, the big uh, question surrounding that is the uh, Dillashaw cutting the extra 10 pounds to go down to that weight. You did research and you found an article that said that fighters that cut the extra weight have a really bad... Well, no, the whole thing was uh, Sejudo, uh, one of, like, when he was asked, like, what he's, like, they have their quotes. They were both on uh, Ariel Hawani's uh, MMA show. Uh, and uh, they he said, like, yeah, uh, champions don't move down to win championship only they only move up in weight yeah. so i did a little research to see how much that is true and apparently for every like super fight like champion versus champion fight it is the person moving down in weight has lost every fight except have you figured this out yet no have you figured this out yet jose aldo versus frankie edgar 
because Jose Aldo was the featherweight uh, champion. And Aldo moved down from lightweight. Or, sorry, Edgar moved down from lightweight. Um, no. Um, uh, oh, no. Wait, no. Yeah, because you said the person who cut the extra weight lost every time. Edgar moved down from lightweight to fight Aldo at feather. Okay, so he's still... So that's still not... So he's still... Because Aldo won that fight. Aldo won that fight. So that's still not the same thing. Interesting. Wait. So Frankie Edgar cut the weight and he lost the fight. So that's still with Sejudo's message. Message. Mm, I'm missing something here then. Because I thought you said that there was one case where somebody won moving down. No, I thought it was two. I, mis- I misread it. I'm saying like I'm wrong when I said that. So yeah, that means every other one that they have here... Uh, uh, Conor McGregor and uh, Alvarez. Uh, I think Alvarez was the one moving. Or no, Conor Conor moved moved up. Moved to up fight. and beat Alvarez. Yeah, moved up. McGregor and beat Alvarez. moved up and beat Diaz. Yeah, uh, Edgar. Uh, moved, yeah, he went down to Aldo and he lost. Um, the other one was. Uh, oh, I guess the only other one was uh, BJ Penn uh, fighting George St Pierre. That's the one. Because BJ Penn was lightweight, George was welterweight, and BJ Penn won that fight. BJ Penn moved up, though. They didn't fight at 155, they fought at 170. Where BJ oh, also right. won a belt. Yeah, that's true. Beating Matthews. Yeah, that's true. So, other than that, yeah. So, it, they have no one has gone down in weight. And that will continue. You, th- you think so? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think... So, Judo beat Mighty Mouse. Yeah, but, my, like... Who knows? I think Dillashaw had a chance, would have a chance to beat Mighty Mouse. Sure, but I don't think that Dillashaw is a better fighter than Sejudo. And I, I think, think? I, I think that the credit has to go to not, like, title wins. Sejudo beat the unbeatable man. Yeah. TJ beat the Henan Barrow, who'd essentially crushed 30 tin cans in a row. Yeah. And Garbrandt twice. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. He didn't, I was like... Cody just, talks too much. Yeah, I think he uh, like does. He didn't look that bad. Like he's pretty close to the weight cut. He's been cutting it over a longer period of time and everything. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's more fair because I think TJ's smart enough to not do dumb things. Although I don't know how old the video was, but there was a video of him training on like one of the airport like baggage things. Oh really? Bring, yeah, it was just him and his coach were on it as it was moving. He was like testing his footwork on. I was like, how is that helpful to you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Anyway, we've left Sean out of this conversation for too long, so let's talk about baseball. Baseball. Uh, really quickly, Melvin Upton Jr. is changing his name back. Back B. to B.J. Upton. B.J. Upton. That's just uh, Johnny. Yep. yep. Johnny found something about John Wetland getting charged with John, sexual assault. John Wetland. Oh, really? Where is it? Well, um, you're looking for that. I'll talk to Sean really quickly. Uh, White Sox offer Manny Machado $175 million over seven years. All I have to say is oof. And well, and if you look at the AAV of that, it's actually twenty five million, which is actually a gross underpay from what Bryce Harper's going to get because they think they're going to get identical contracts. Machado's not getting the same amount as Bryce Harper. No, he's absolutely not. Also, th- I is. think this puts to bed the rumors that Harper was thinking about going with the White Sox. I don't think they offer Machado the contract if they're getting Harper. Yeah, and, and I think that's the thing. I think Harper is going to sign in the National League. I don't know. It's, it's Phillies. Seems like it's the Phillies. Yeah, I, I, I think the Phillies is where you put your money right now, but don't count out Washington. I, I think the fact that they've ling- lingered sort of as a player for this long bodes well for them. You don't think? I think Har- it does. Do you think Harper's maybe just testing how much his market value is worth, but actually wants to stay in Washington? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to uproot my life. I, w- I wouldn't play for a team it. for half a decade. I wouldn't doubt it, right? He he probably just wants to go see what's out there, and if no one's going to give him anything re- like ludicrously more than what Washington's going to give him, then why would you leave? Why would you leave such a good thing? Anyway, Wetland. Uh, so, yeah, Wetland, a former All-Star and World Series MVP, has been charged in Texas with continuous sexual abuse of a child under the age of 14. He was arrested on Monday and freed on a $25,000 bond. Uh, and uh, so according to the consolidated complaint and, prob- and probable cause affidavit, Wetland is accused of having performed, uh, having a child perform a sexual act on him beginning in 2004 when the child was the age of four. All right, that's oh, all I want to talk about that. Yeah. That's yeah. awful. Mm-hmm. So he's going to jail. That's yeah. profoundly gross. He's probably going I'm to jail. I'm shocked that he was released on bail. Yeah. That's insane. It must, he's got to have like, some sort of house arrest or something like that. Like You can't let someone like that just want I mean, he's on a anyway. bond, so. Yeah, so yeah, yeah like there's conditions to his bail. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, basketball, because I don't want to linger on that story any longer than I have to. That's gr I'm actually, like, my skin is crawling. Mm -hmm. Ten years? Because you said she was 14. No, it was a child under the age of 14. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm, I grossly misunderstood that, but it's still not any better. Yeah. So. I just, you just, it just got stopped from being worse. Yeah. Anyways, uh, basketball. Syracuse upset Duke. Yes. Which is oh, because yeah. which is relevant because Duke is all anyone can talk about. Mm -hmm. To the point that they've literally been posting stats about Duke players in games between two completely different teams. Oh, really? It's awful. <laughs> Props yeah. to RJ Barrett for picking a team that's probably going to win a national championship hands down unless they blow it like they always do cuz it's Duke. Cuz it's Duke. I th also Zion Williamson's going first overall. I don't know to who, but he is. Yep. Probably the Cavs. <laughs> I'll I don't even the think they have a first-round pick this year. I don't know. Uh, James Harden is really dumb and good at basketball. Yeah, uh, I think it's 18 straight 30-point games for him, and his last two games have been 50-pointers. Uh, 50 50-pointers, 50 yep. That's like some Steph Curry numbers. Yeah, for sure. That That's ridiculous. Uh, Warriors record 51-point first quarter against the Nuggets. Is anyone that surprised? Yeah. I'm surprised it's happening against the Nuggets, who are arguably the second best team in the West. Yeah, that's a NBA record. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so. it has to be. How, how long oh. are NBA court? Are they still 15 minutes? Yeah. How do you do that? More than one possession a minute. How? How? how uh, just yeah, hit how, every three. How many uh, points is that per minute? Three point something. So okay, well then. You, so you've you, scored on both possessions you've had every single minute for a quarter. And you basically hit them in threes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Or you just keep stealing the ball and don't let the other team have possession. Correct. <laughs> Which is hard. But anyway. I watched the Raptors-Celtics game and got profoundly angry at Pascal Siakam. Why is that? Okay, so the Raptors, oh, are, dead. Yeah. Raptors are dead by one. There's about a minute left in the game. Siakam tries to make a cut inside, gets triple teamed. Mm -hmm. He kicks it out to Kawhi Leonard on the outside. Kawhi takes a step to the left, crosses his defender over, pulls up to take a three, gets the ball knocked out of his hands, Kawhi goes, hey, that's a foul. He hit me on the arm. And the ref goes, no, I've already called a violation before that. And Kawhi goes, for what? After Siakam kicked the ball out to Kawhi, he stood there and watched Kawhi shoot the three, standing in the key. Oh, and got a three-second violation and lost possession for Toronto when they were down by one. See, I always forget about that rule in basketball. You can only stay in the key for three, three seconds, seconds at a time. That's oh. why you see them constantly yes. like darting in and out and everything. So. Siakam ball watched because he expected that Kawhi would put up the shot right away, and Kawhi didn't. He had to make a move to try to shake the defender, and that was long enough. Oh, crap. You can't get caught Frick. ball watching when you're down by one, dude. I know that he's yeah. young, and God, is he talented, but... Ah. Uh. Yeah. Growing pains. So I'm, I'm assuming they lost. The, I'm assuming yeah, they, they lost, lost yeah, that game with Celtics. They yeah. rebounded last night against Phoenix, though, and okay. they're still first in the East. Okay. Uh, football uh, briefly. Kyler Murray declares for the draft. He essentially told the Athletics, "Pay me the same signing bonus I'm going to get from the NFL draft or I leave." And the Athletics said no, because they can't afford that. Mm -hmm. So Kyler Murray declares for the NFL draft. Mm. Uh, I don't know where he's going to go. People think he's going to be the first quarterback off the board. I'm a little more hesitant to say that, but. I don't know. Franchise quarterbacks are kind of hard to find. Team's looking for one. I don't know. It's it's just really weird when you look in the the grand scheme of it. So we had a choice to play football or baseball. Oh, are we gonna are we gonna get into the football baseball debate about like well, safety I mean, and stuff? If if we want to, I, I mean, we, I, we I do not have time for that. Is my point. well, I, like all, all I was gonna say is like baseball is an infinitely safer sport, and you're probably gonna still have like your body after. Yeah, I so, I, I don't get it either. He's doing it for the immediate money. Yeah, cool, good for him. Go I guess. for it. You might also want the glory from football. I feel like there's more glory in football than there is in baseball. but Yeah, I find the glory in baseball like lasts a week. Uh, Super Bowl is going to be broadcast in 8K on CBS. If you have an 8K mm. television, good for you, rich guy. Yep. <laughs> also, after like 2480 or whatever, you can't tell the 2440, you can't tell the difference. Um, there's a petition right now saying that the Super Bowl halftime performers should take a knee during their performance. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. No. Uh, Jeremy O'Day has been named the new Riders GM. That's more noteworthy because Chris Jones is now the defensive assistant for the Cleveland Browns. Cool. That team's probably making the playoffs next year, which is a weird thing to say about the Cleveland Browns. Yep. Oh, well. All misery has to end at some point. They're my new right? favorite team. They had a good year this year. Yeah. 
they were they were genuinely fun to watch, and it's weird thinking that a couple missed field goals were the difference between them making the playoffs and not. Mm-hmm. Baker Mayfield is a hell of a quarterback. Yeah, and if they don't have what Hugh Jackson the first couple <sighs> games of the year, it's he got yeah. fired from Cincinnati, by the way. Yep. <laughs> I think I'm going to become a Cleveland Browns fan. I'd be fine with it. I need more NFL fans to watch with anyway. If you want to root for the Browns, you root for the Browns. Yeah, the I think I'm. I think I'm. Guess I'm arbitrarily like nominated by Kayla to cheer for the Browns. Well, I was making the joke because we were covering it, and you were genuinely interested in the story. You can cheer for whoever you want. Yeah, but see, Johnny and I, we we cheer for long suffering teams. Like oh, yeah. it's it's a thing that it's 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 like a kink. Yeah. Anyways, hockey. <laughs> <laughs> And we have an episode title, ladies and gentlemen. True. <laughs> uh, I would not call it that, but... Uh. Uh, Jake Allen's new mask. So he has a new mask inspired by New Brunswick? Yes. Good for him. Good for him. Boy, you've been playing bad this year, and your team is awful. Mm. Your best player is David Perron. Ooh, that's not good. <laughs> Even though, I mean, like, Perron's a good player. Like, don't take it away from him, but, I mean, holy crap. Uh, Jerome McGinley's number's going to be retired by the Flames? Good. Who are they playing? The um, retirement. I don't know. It's their March 3rd game, I think. Because, like, logically, it should be Boston or Colorado. Yeah, I think that is a that will be a Sunday night game. Oh, is that Hockey Day in Canada? No, Hometown Hockey. Or Hometown Hockey. It'll be Hometown Hockey, probably, so. When is Hockey Day? Because uh, it's around there, too. Here, I'll check. Can you look that up really quick, Sean? Yeah. Um, also, uh, Paul Byron suspended uh, three games. Yeah. Yeah. February 9th. I mean, he Definitely deserved not. the suspension. So, mm-hmm. um, John Scott's surprisingly alive after getting into a car crash and falling through some ice. No, no, uh, it's not. It wasn't a car crash. I was thinking of something else when I wrote when I wrote down the notes and everything. He just oh. felt he was just walking on like ice, like skating with his kids. And oh yeah, he, he fell through was, a lake. Yeah, fell yeah. through a lake. Um, uh, we can skip over the Duchesne story. Um, ter- uh, I mean, really, really quick. The Senators have essentially said that they don't have any regrets about what's happened with the Matt Duchesne trade, and they think that they need to restein Duchesne and Stone as the cornerstones of their rebuild. I think that's dumb. Yep, I am in agreement with that. Because we've seen what happens when you build a team around Duchesne, you get the Colorado Avalanche of a few years ago. Yeah. Um, Terry Sawtrek is going to have a book based on his life story. Uh, Josh George is, uh, has announced his retirement. Uh, Sebastian Ajo is going to be playing two All-Star games. Two different Sebastian Ajos. Yeah, that's the joke. Um, and uh, the World Cup of Hockey is not going to happen in 2020 because they are worried, like, they don't want it to happen just in case the slight chance, I guess, of uh, work stoppage because there's an early opt-out clause in the CBA. That ends after this season. Ends after the season, yeah. I don't think they're going to opt out. I think the fact that they're negotiating already is a good sign. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone wants to miss half a season again. Yeah. I think that the debate is going to be... I feel like the final agreement is going to be if the players agree to keep escrow, they get to go to the Olympics. As long as escrow will cover them if they get hurt at the Olympics. And I think that's going to be the offer that the, the, the big offer that the owners make. You take that. Probably. If you're not going to change yeah. it. If you, don't, if you aren't going to change anything else... I think if the owners ask for salary rollbacks for the third time in a row, they're idiots. Because yeah. you guys got to institute a cap and two straight sets of salary rollbacks. You cannot now demand rollbacks after you just paid McDavid 12-5 and Tavares 11. And the cap is going up consistently. And you The have, league's making money. And you have two new teams that have rejected a crap ton is the reason why your cap's going up so much. Yeah. Um, Shen Fridell's, uh quick, we've, so we've got about five minutes left. We'll power through a couple of trades right here. Luke Shen of the San Diego Gulls of the AHL has been traded to the Vancouver Canucks for Michael Delzato. We have have nothing but speculation on this trade. It's weird. Mm-hmm. It's just a strange trade for two, for especially for a Canucks team that's one point out of a playoff spot, mm-hmm. for them to be trading even a bottom-pairing defenseman when they don't have someone in the system to take their place. Uh, Nino Niederreiter for Vist- Victor Rask is just a good hockey trade. Yep. Minnesota clearly is trying to mix something up to try to beat the teams that are clearly better than them. Carolina really needs a scoring winger. Yeah. Now that the, since they don't have Jeff Skinner anymore, so. Uh, you mean All Star Jeff Skinner? Yep. You mean Mike yes. Winter Rocket Richard this year, Jeff Skinner? Yep. Um, I hope he does. Cogliano and Shore. That was that's Anaheim trying to mix it up because they were in the middle of a disastrous losing streak. Same with the uh, Pontus Aberg for Justin Clouse. And then they broke it. They broke the losing streak last night. Oh, did they? Mostly thanks to John Gibson, but... I think yeah. that trade's also a versatility kind of thing. Because the, the Auberg trade? N- well, well, the Auberg one, the uh, the Shore one, because Shore plays all... Th- uh, like, he... Uh, 
he like in Dallas he alternated a lot. Yeah, like he he played all, all four positions in our uh, on on fan tracks. If you're into fantasy hockey, he has he's listed as all three. Pontus Aberg kind of put me off a little bit, but he's an older guy, so I, I think he's like 25. Uh, I want to save so. the discussion about the Oilers' first round pick for. Monday, because we are not going to have enough time to get to that okay. this week, right. and I think that there's a much more interesting story there that requires at least 20 minutes of debate or so. Okay, Jake Gardner. Jake Gardner. Mm. You guys Boot. have four minutes to talk about Jake Gardner. Uh, boot off the ice after a horrendous performance by him. Uh, that goal he uh, let for uh, Sodenberg. I'm not sure which part of the hat trick that was, but uh, it was brutal. And th- I'm I'm caught in the middle on this because. The crow that Jake Gardner ate for that is not undeserved because this is not the first time he has basically been caught with his pants around his ankles in a key part of a game. It's, I don't know, it's it's rough. I don't think it's not deserved, but I don't think the, I still think he's a valued part of the team. He's just so damn frustrating. It's hard to love him. It, it really is sometimes. Despite his points production, he just gets caught in the worst, in the worst ways. Well, I, see, I think we spend a lot of time saying, "Who are you going to get to play with Morgan Riley? Who are you going to get to play with Jake Gardner?" Like he, he's this, it's the same problem. It's the it, like, and this is why you can't put it solely on Jake Gardner. Look at his defensive partners throughout like his history as a Maple Leaf. Yeah, he doesn't have the benefit of a sturdy defensive partner like Ron Hainsey. Precisely. Yeah. That's no, but, but but that's just what it comes down to is that Jake Gardner doesn't have someone to make up for his lapses, and he has a lot of lapses. Riley has a lot of lapses, yeah. but H- Hainsey's there to cover it up. It'd be nice if they could add someone at the at the deadline to either play with him to shore up, like when he gets caught flat-footed or caught at the blue line, which has happened countless times throughout his career, and or someone to just like less it because he eats a lot of minutes. Oh, he, he does. He does eat a like lot of minutes. Like 25 a night. And I think it just be... I think Jake Gardner in less minutes, it's kind of like the FNUF syndrome. FNUF would have been a great player for the Leafs if he wasn't required to eat the amount of minutes that he was assigned every night. He just is not the caliber of player to eat up that kind of pressure and that kind of responsibility. I think the Leafs would be in a far worse defensive situation without him, but I can't fault fans for being frustrated because this is not the first time that Jake Gardner has laid an egg as big as this. And it goes all the way back. Yeah, it goes all the way back to Boston, which is what uh, Jeff O'Neill was saying on on Jay and Dan and everything like that. It was was bad. But uh, one thing that did kind of uh, give me kind of like a kind of a a humbling and put me in my place a little bit was one Sid Sixero who said um you know that Jake Gardner is what he is, and he's probably never going to change, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, that doesn't make me any less angry, but you're right. And I think, I don't know how we handle this. I'm kind of gritting my teeth at the idea of losing him for nothing in free agency at the end of the year. Um, but I'm not sure whether we move him by the deadline. I don't think you do. No. no. Just ride it out and see what we can get the best out of him. They did it last year with JVR, Bozak, Komarov. 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I think this might be his last year in Toronto. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if there's a feasible way to keep him. Especially I, the money. He's a 50-point yeah. defenseman. He's going to make way too much Seven on mil. the open mind. Yeah. Seven mil. Easy. Yeah. All right. That's all the time we have today. Thank you for tuning in to Overtime Radio on CHSR 979 FM broadcasting out of Fredericton. Or if you're watching the vid- vidcast replay on YouTube, we appreciate all of you. And you'll hear from us Monday from 2 to 3. Uh, and then that vidcast should be up maybe not until the next day because the weather in Fredericton is supposed to be brutal. Uh, but you guys will hear from us. We will have a show for you that day come hell or high water. You'll So uh, we'll... You guys will tune in on Monday. We should have some updates in regards to AUS hockey because this is a big weekend for playoff positioning in particular. And we will cover the deal, which is that people are projecting that the Oilers' number one draft pick might be a big piece of trade bait, which is interesting for a team that is currently not in the playoff spot. Yep. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and we will see you soon.